I had spent the last 27 hours changing planes and sitting in airports. I was exhausted, and I couldn't wait to settle in for a shower and proper food in my hotel. I was an academic, you see, a professor of geology at the University of North Carolina to be precise. I was one of the best in my field, and I was being dragged across the planet like a graduate assistant forced to run errands. All of this was to help with a favor for a close friend. He had given me scant information about what he was involved in, and frankly, I was quite perturbed. But I agreed to come. I did not agree to be starved, however. The whole thing started three days prior. I was in Venezuela. I had been hired by a major mining company to perform surveys to locate deposits of precious minerals. The operation was a five-year contract, paying six figures each year with a bonus for major deposits found. I had lived the last 18 months in the lap of luxury, being wine and dined by executives who saw me as a ticket to potential trillions of dollars in profits. I didn't mind, of course. Beluga caviar, the finest champagnes and wines, and exotic women in my villa were par for the course, and I enjoyed it to the fullest. I was fast asleep amidst my silk sheets when I heard the buzz of my mobile phone. I grumbled and tossed it to the floor. It rang three times more from a blocked number before I finally answered. It took every ounce of energy to lift my head up from the pillow and grumble a salutation, even if it was weak. What? My cotton mouth caused me to rasp the words from my parched lips. Jesus Christ, Mel. Is that you? You sound like shit. I instantly recognized the sound of my old roommate's voice. Tony, is that you? Uh, hold on a minute, will you? I sat up, momentarily energized. Regret followed that decision, and I was forced to lay my head back down. The room continued to spin. I placed the foot on the cold hardwood floors to slow everything down. Malachi, it's good to hear your voice. How's Caracas? Toasty warm, with lots of quality scenery. I shot a glance over my shoulder at the buxom woman who lay naked on the other side of the bed. What was her name again? Veronica? Valerie? Chloe? That was it. No, no it wasn't. Malachi, I uh, need a favor. A big one. How tied down to those miners are you? I could hear the urgency in his voice. Antonio Bania Cortez was my best friend for 25 years. We had met as freshmen at UNC and stayed together all through graduate school. He was an archaeologist at one point for the Museum of History in Raleigh, but had been off on digs for years. I had no idea what he did anymore. I can get away for a week if I need to. What's this about? We found something in a rock mall. Something big, groundbreaking, revolutionary. But I need your help to confirm it. You're the only man I trust for the job. If you can hold down a security clearance. The earnestness with which he said those words tucked at my heartstrings. Listen, the Venezuelans don't particularly like Americans right now. I don't know if it would be the safest thing. We can pay you. Half a million US for a consulting fee, if we can make it by Friday. Tony said flatly. I could hear the disappointment in his voice, but did not have the strength to fight with him about it. I will pack a bag. See you Friday, old friend. That's how the phone conversation ended. What followed was an endless torrent of emails and non-disclosure agreements I was sure to violate the shit out of to the highest bidder, if given enough to drink. I was forced to fly economy, smashed against the window by a soccer mom who talked endlessly about her children, in Spanish, to someone else who didn't care to listen to. I let my earbuds in my villa. The headache, however, came along for flight. When we landed in Mexico City, I thought about a hotel room, but my layover didn't allow for it. A six-hour delay forced me to stay on the plane. We transferred to a larger plane and touched down in Germany that evening. I was picked up by two large men in military uniforms and roughly placed into an SUV. I was driven to Ramstein Air Base and shoved into a US Air Force cargo plane with little fanfare. Without a drink, my anxiety overtook me on the flight, and I threw up several times before passing out from exhaustion. We landed the next morning in Iraq. I found breakfast to be utterly lacking in every way. A 40 minute drive and I arrived at my hotel for the evening, a small military installation. 
I nearly fell from the cramped car as it parked on the concrete. A tall, thin man with overly slick black hair approached in an off-the-rack navy suit with brown tie. A white smile showed perfectly straight teeth. His evenly tanned and non-blemished skin contrasted with the white shirt under his jacket. His deep brown eyes lit up as he saw me. I tried to stand up straight, but my back and knees did not allow it. It was oppressively hot, but he did not seem faced in the least. Tony, you could have sent a car to get me. And what's the deal with the economy, plane tickets? Ah, complain, complain. Look at you, you look like an old man, practically falling apart. He let out a chuckle, I interpreted as night. Do I need to call the boo-boo bus for you? The rich lifestyle has made you a bit soft, Malachi. That's Dr. Malachi. So, what's the deal, Tony? You find Cortez's record collection in the jungle? Tony's smile faded. His eyes shifted left and right, then locked back on me. Not here, he said as he handed me a thick packet in a manila envelope. Read this over, then get some rest. I will pick you up tomorrow after breakfast. Keep your wits about you, Malachi. You look like you drink too much. I brushed him off and asked him to stay for dinner. After a moment, he declined and left in the silver pickup truck. I checked into my quarters and found my long-awaited shower. A nice dinner and 18 cocktails from the bottles of vodka I smuggled in my bags pushed me towards a deep sleep. Just a good night's rest, and I will get my day started right. I set an alarm for 6 a.m. and poured a nightcap before laying across the bed in my suit. At 4.45 a.m., I woke up in a cold sweat and threw up in the trash can. Tony greeted me out front. It was 9 in the morning, and it was already 100 degrees. He laughed relentlessly at my condition and forced a bottled water into my hand. He inquired about breakfast, but I told him I felt under the weather. I grabbed the muffin and decided to leave. As we walked outside, I saw he had been driven in an overly large black suburban. How does this suit you, Dr. Malachi Andrew McMillian III? The sarcasm was practically palpable as he rattled off each syllable in a cartoonish, enunciated tone. I stared over the frames of my sunglasses at the car for a moment before I readjusted them. Fine, I said meekly and stepped into the open door. Tony didn't talk much. He kept his eyes glued to the tablet as he flicked through various screens. I drained the water and took a glance around the SUV's cabin. No booze here, Mal. It's a Muslim country. Only water. Oh, I think there's Pepsi in the compartment closest to you. Tony didn't even look up from his work. I cracked the can and took a long swallow before I placed the frigid aluminum can against my temple. Tony shook his head slightly, but said nothing. A 90-minute car ride took us deep into the desert. The endless piles of sand were somehow relaxing and perked me up a bit from my hangover. The SUV ducked off the main road and onto a dirt path. Ah, here we are, Tony said as we passed by over a wooden bridge near a long dead river. Welcome to Project Call Milo, Tony said matter-of-factly. A huge archaeological dig site sprawled before us, covering at least one square mile. The sand had been cleared down to the rock beneath to provide space for the heavy equipment scattered all around. Trailers and makeshift buildings were cramped against a never-ending wall of dunes to the right of the entryway. On the left, the largest white tent I had ever seen was erected. It looked like the inflated dome of a football stadium, perhaps 300 feet across and 50 feet high. In the center and just behind the structures, a pit was dug. Orange dust climbed in pillars from the pit as crews worked deep in the earth. This is not what I expected. What were you expecting exactly? Not a villa by the beach, but it's good enough for us regular folk. Tony's sheepish smile made me angry for some reason. I took another swig of my Pepsi, but said nothing as we parked. The main doors of the office building opened, and the most beautiful woman I had ever seen walked out. Her Class A Air Force uniform was professional, but the tailored navy blue pants over her heavily toned legs left little to the imagination. Awards were plastered up to the left side of the jacket. Tony and I exited the car as he strode to meet her halfway across the concrete parking lot. 
She hugged Tony gently and exchanged a warm greeting before she turned to face me. I was utterly lost as I stared at her caramel color skin and her light honey eyes. Her straightened hair was pulled tight into a bun to keep the reddish tinted black hair just off the collar. Are you okay, Dr. McMillian? The woman's voice snapped me out of my trance as I realized she had spoken to me several times. Uh, what? She appeared irritated already. Not a good start. I said welcome to hell, doctor. How was your flight? Oh, good. It was good. You look very good. This whole thing is nice. That was the best I could muster. I think part of my soul died right there on the ground in the blazing heat. She stared at me and I could almost hear her inner voice calling me a moron. Tony face palmed over her shoulder and rubbed his forehead. Right, I am Major Jordan Broadhurst, US Air Force. Follow me please, gentlemen. She turned and walked toward the facility as Tony barely contained his laughter. Very smooth, very smooth indeed. He whispered as he scanned his ID badge and we walked inside the temporary office building. Briefing in 10 minutes, gentlemen, main conference room. Dr. Cortez, make sure he doesn't get lost, the Major said. I couldn't help but stare as she walked down the hallway and out of sight. Tony led me to his spacious, well-furnished office. He situated himself at his desk and began to log into his computer. Several items were spread over the desk. Why is the US military on a dick side? And what does the government need with an archaeologist anyway? And why is that Air Force chick so fine? So many questions. The government always needs a good archaeologist. I spent a week with the Ark of the Covenant, you know. You would be surprised what we find buried in the dark corners of the world. Even though he was smiling, he said it so deadspan, I couldn't tell if he was joking or not. I gestured to a deformed lizard statue on the side of his desk and picked it up. A copper-tinged hexagon sat on his forehead. A dagger laid next to it, made from reflective blackstone, probably obsidian, I thought to myself. The handle was ornately carved in the image of a serpent. It appeared to be made of bone. Your newest pillaged trophies, I presume. A snake wrapped in bondage rope. Where did this come from? As I turned it over in my hand, I noticed how warm it was. The heat seemed to radiate outwards from the inside. I thought I heard a brief whisper behind me, but my reflexes were so slow, I barely registered it through my hangover. I told myself it might be the air conditioning turning on, and ignored it. Recovered, not pillaged, and to be honest, I'm not entirely sure. Sumerian, I think. Some sort of winged serpent deity. Unique. Got it from a Bedouin trader near the border with Iran. It gives off its own electric magnetic field. And it's slightly radioactive. He laughed as I quickly sat it back down. Relax, it's harmless. Although, it does make the computer go a bit crazy if it gets too close. It has a plate of carbonite there on the head. It's in the handle of that knife too. The eyes of the snake are made of carbonite chips. My heart practically jumped from my chest. We have only ever found 29 grams of the stuff on the entire planet. Carbonite is the most powerful conductor ever discovered. It's malleable but incredibly heat resistant. Its properties are unprecedented. Why would someone put it on a flying snake statue? It's thousands of years old, Malachi. They probably didn't know what it was. The glyph carvings on the statue is also strange. Some of the symbols are cuneiform, but the others, no idea. I can't believe it. Corbonite, it's amazing. I stared with newfound appreciation of the statue. You haven't said anything about you being the one who discovered Corbonite since I brought it up. Are you not feeling well today? I beamed a white smile at Tony. I didn't think it was my place to brag about my discoveries to my best friend on his job site. Uh, first for you then. The statue does have some other odd properties. Like what, Tony? Does it whisper to you in the dark? Free me, feed me, let me loose. I growled in my best column voice and laughed so hard my head came back. Tony did not. Something like that, yes. Tony did not smile. He did not move. It looked like he wasn't even breathing. He just stared at me. The coldness in his eyes was unnatural. 
The whole thing made me nervous. I saw he had been reviewing a photograph of what looked like an elephant tusk on his computer. I wanted to ask him about it, but his eyes bore into me and made me swallow my question. Finally, he spoke again to break the tension. Come on, it's time for you to see why you're here. I opened another Pepsi as we entered a conference room. Eighteen chairs sat around a wooden table with a large projector screen on the far wall. A laptop computer sat nearby, as well as a tablet on the table in front of each chair. I plopped myself into a cushioned chair and drank from the can and held a cup of ice against my forehead as Tony talked to Major Broadhorst. Occasionally, she would glance over at me and frown before she returned to her heated conversation. I've already fucked this up, I thought to myself. I embarrassed my friend, and he has caught all the flack. The door swung open, and a dozen men and women in suits entered the room. I sat up and attempted to look professional. Tony pulled up the chair next to me as the major picked up a tablet. Good morning, I hope everyone is rested and ready to go. Today is a big day for us. Dr. McMillian has flown in from Venezuela to be with us today. He's considered one of, if not the best geologist on the planet. Doctor, did you have a chance to read through your packet? I opened my mouth and closed it again without a word. Her anger practically sliced through my entire body. She pursed her lips, kept her calm, and redirected. Let's get Dr. McMillan caught up, shall we? Seven months ago, an American satellite passed over the area searching for a Turkish cargo plane which crashed deep in the desert without a transponder. The satellite found the plane, but during recovery, found something never seen before. The Air Force tasked my unit with using an advanced satellite to scan the area around the crash site. Further scans made us realize we needed to construct this facility to establish a permanent base of operation for study. I am here as an American liaison to the Iraqi government and technology expert. There, I saved you three hours. All caught up then. That wasn't so bad. I smiled weakly at my own joke and glanced around the room. No one smiled back. I adjusted my necktie and sunk an inch lower in my chair. Major Broadhurst continued. Dr. McMillian, if you will take a look at your tablet, please. I turned the tablet on and opened the only file on the desktop. I nearly coughed up soda onto the screen. As you can see in the images, the site is massive. The total building footprint measures 1,320 feet long by 1,660 feet wide in a rectangular pattern and is 560 feet tall with a 100 foot tall substructure on top for a total of 600 feet tall. For those of you keeping score with your arithmetic, that's really damn big. The anomalous object at the top is inside what appears to be a temple or shrine and is approximately 73 feet in diameter. We believe the anomaly to be made. This is Corbonite, I exclaimed. The Major appeared annoyed. I apologize, but the electromagnetic signature is distinct. This is incredible. You have found a deposit of the rarest metal in the solar system. What's this around it? I pointed towards the geometric building she had described and tore my tablet to face her. It was square with a large blot at its center. This is the largest ziggurat ever found to Dr. McMillian. Major Broadhurst's words hung in the air for a moment. That's impossible. How was this done? Who could have done this? That's why you two are here, Doctor. To help us figure out why one of the oldest buildings ever constructed by mankind, lost for God knows how many years to the desert, is built around a meteor made of the rarest element known in the solar system. Tony leaned over to me. Told you not to drink last night, Mel. I walked down a small corridor next to Tony as I flipped through image after image. Incredible. Just incredible. I repeated. I could stare at these all day. Or all night as it were. They were in your packet, Tony said. A crew of workers had been at it for five months to remove the earth around the ziggurat. The area is still incredibly dangerous and we have been hit by two sandstorms since the dig started. It's been a very slow process. But the construction is a marvel of engineering. When can I see it? I felt like an eager schoolboy. The Corbonite, I mean. I don't care to play with your blocks. The applications are limitless. If this meteor is solid, it's worth tens of billions. Maybe more if we have bidders. 
Yup, money. Not the archaeological find. Not the implications of a gigantic cigarette lost to time, built by an ancient civilization. It's money. I shot Tony an apologetic glance, and he softened his tone for me. He sighed and continued. We can go down there in a moment. I must grab something from my office. You need to change. That jacket will not suit you in the heat, my friend. We have spare day gear in the locker room just there. He pointed to the room directly across the hall. A pyramid explains why they dragged you away from your rocks in Turkey. Ziggurat, not a pyramid. Two different things. Tony walked into his office and stepped inside. When I exited the room in my standard tan t-shirt and old hand-me-down denim jeans, Tony was not done yet. I could hear a murmur through the door to someone. Did he really leave me outside to make a call? After two minutes, he stepped back out, closed and locked his door. He wore a safari outfit and hat. He was visibly sweating. Uh, you okay buddy? You look like me after a bad night out. I said it as lightheartedly as I could. His turn was so sudden, I was worried. Fine, fine, just feeling a little bit warm in the office. He adjusted his hat strap and we made our way out of the office into the blistering heat of the Iraqi desert. We walked a short distance to the pit which had been dug into the sand. Tony regained his composure a little as we approached. Major Bratwurst had changed her uniform into a khaki button-down shirt and cargo pants with matching well-worn tan combat boots. Her sidearm was nestled against her right thigh in a dark brown leather drop holster which matched the large brown fedora bent at the brim. She beamed proudly with her fists on hips as she stood near the edge of the pit. Her biceps were flexed and her brown skin glistened from applied sun tan lotion. The entire outfit vaguely reminded me of Indiana Jones. I was totally mesmerized. It's time for your nickel tour, boys. Her enthusiasm was positively infectious. My hangover eased ever so slightly just from her energy. I peered over the side, and I found myself in awe. The ziggurat, a monstrous temple from the ancient world, was nearly completely excavated. The ornate carvings and colossal pillars which lined the walls were so well preserved you would have thought it was built only recently. The whole thing is built directly on bedrock. That means the 500 plus feet of sand on top of it has moved over the ages. But there is little to no corrosion or degradation to the outer walls and art. It's almost like the ziggurat was buried as soon as it was built. She showed us to a cramped rickety elevator that resembled little more than a shark cage on a pulley system. The ride was bumpy, and I said a Hail Mary on two separate occasions when I thought the whole thing was going to collapse. I hadn't said a Hail Mary since my grandmother died. What was going on with me today? I gratefully stepped out onto the limestone and surveyed the excavation site. Tents scattered the grounds, and local workers moved sand by the wheelbarrow load from exposed doorways and windows at the base. I spotted a large cooler and greedily consumed two bottles of water from it. Tony removed a large bottle from his satchel and took a sip. The locals eyed me angrily. I realized too late I had committed a faux pas. Standing at the base, I was truly in awe of the sheer size of the thing. It was as if a shopping mall made of sandstone and granite were as tall as a skyscraper. How's your cardio, Mal? I'll be fine. Looks like a piece of cake. Just curious, how many steps is it to the top? Major Broadhurst answered, much to my chagrin. Just under 3,000. The staircases wind around the ziggurat to various platforms. Should take about 20 minutes to reach the top. I stared at her in abject terror. We haven't finished excavating the ceremonial staircase yet. It won't be finished until Tuesday. Limber up, Doc. The Major patted me on the shoulder and started her climb. She quickly outpaced us both and waited at the first landing. We followed the superstructure of winding staircase after winding staircase. It wrapped around into rooms and antechambers. Glyphs and letters and languages I could not identify lined every square inch of the walls in each room we passed through. I was fascinated. Tony and Major Broadhurst pushed on, nonchalant as can be about the epic tail chisel into the walls before us. By the time we reached the top, 
I felt utterly exhausted. I wanted to vomit, but I didn't even have the liquid in my stomach to dry heave. Tony handed me his bottle of water, and I took a grateful sip. You should do more cardio. Come on, your rock is just in here. Major Bradhorst turned, and I looked upward. The gargantuan temple towered 100 feet above the top of the ziggurat. Arches formed to 15-foot openings, six on each side, beckoning us forward into the inner sanctum. Paintings of gods and monsters towered over us from floor to ceiling inside. The entire room was illuminated by a soft warm yellow glow. I could see a tentacled, eldritch terror leveling cities and devouring people by the thousand. I saw warriors of old do battle with gigantic bird-like horrors. A monstrous creature of the abyss, a leviathan of ungodly proportions, flattened a beautiful seaside village with impunity as one surviving onlooker surveyed the devastation from a hill. A mighty city with vast temples and rings of aqueducts was smashed to ruin by a tidal wave brought on from the wrath of an angry ocean god. Each painting came with line upon line of text in some language along that and completely alien to me. It was awe-inspiring. Still thinking about your shiny metal now, Malachi. Tony stepped up next to me and clasped my shoulder. This is the biggest archaeological find since King Tut. It was at this point that I realized the light towers and generators nearby were not on. The entire shrine was illuminated by something. The Corbonite. It appeared to glow like it produced its own light from the inside. A sudden burst of light momentarily blinded us all. Major Bradhorst answered my question before I asked it. It does that sometimes when enough people get in here. Not sure why. I looked at it for the first time in earnest. The gargantuan ball of metallic ore sat at the center of the room and dwarfed us all. It was roughly spherical, with a smooth shell bearing only minor scratches and indentations. Shell? Like an egg? Huh? What was that, Mel? Tony asked as I came back to reality. Nothing. Just thinking aloud, I guess. Looking back at the paintings lining the stone walls, I saw one on the furthest wall which caught my eye. I walked over to it and looked it over. The art was carved into the wall instead of painted. It appeared much older than the rest. It was crudely chiseled into the wall instead of ordinarily painted. It sent shivers down my spine which radiated through my arms and legs in waves. It depicted a nightmarish abomination of a creature, an indescribable mess of spikes and lines with a single slitted eye at its center. The thing was surrounded by other objects. They appeared simply as rings, stacked rings being devoured by this creature. The abomination was injured, leaking a green trail across the black backdrop of the art. It was not in a lush forest or coastal city depicted in the intricate paintings which surrounded it. The backdrop was simply black. It was a blank space muddled with the occasional dot of white or yellow or red. The creature was chased by its attackers, until finally the painting finished with it bound in chains, as insignificantly tiny humans looked on. Isn't it spectacular? Tony's voice echoed deeply in the mammoth chamber. Tony, what are these things here? These rings? Angels, Tony said. I stared him down. Angels? In their ancient depictions, angels weren't plump little babies with halos, Malachi. They were terrifying messengers and powerful warriors. They were often depicted as stacked concentric rings with eyes and fire and blades. I remember Sunday school, Tony. This is old. Very old. What's it doing with the Corbonite? It doesn't make any sense. This temple should predate any art of Judeo-Christian angels by three or four thousand years. A shadow moved across the carvings. Gentlemen, your attention if you please. Major Bradhorst's voice had more than a hint of stress in it. Something was moving inside the Corbonite. A deep rumble shook the shrine and dust rained upon us. A voice spoke to us, and yet seemingly everywhere. It was slow, weak, and pained. Finally, I have been imprisoned here for so long, and you 
have brought. My salvation. How? That's... that's English. I stammered out. The voice seemed to rattle inside my head over and over and over until it became painful. I could only drop to my knees as I lost equilibrium and the words practically banged against the side of my skull. I saw images flash before my eyes. Scenes of a beautiful, lush landscape on fire and a mighty river dried out as it boiled into nothing. Clouds which rained hellfire upon everything below. A mountain spewed forth volcanic ash and steam as the sun was smothered in the blanket of darkness. No, not a sun. It was an eye. A giant, lidless eye towered over the planet. Darkened clouds of ash drifted by the cat-like split, paling in comparative size. I could hear the eye speak, like a malevolent god proclaiming its gospel, but I could not understand it at all. The word salvation repeated over and over in my head. I finally broke free of the fever dream and regained my senses. I looked up from my position on my knees and saw Tony, motionless. It was like he was not affected at all. Tony? Tony, can you hear that too? I hear it in Spanish. Tony said flatly. His voice was distorted, like he was in a daze. Major? Doesn't matter, the rock is talking, time to go. She appeared apprehensive, and her stance showed she was ready to move at a moment's notice. She was truly a woman of action. Meanwhile, I was practically crippled on the floor. The voice came again. It was soft and loving, but still weak. You found me. After all this time, I shall forever be grateful to you. I felt like I could almost see a shape move inside the Corbonite. Tony spoke up, far braver than I felt in that moment. Who is speaking to us? Do you have a name? What is a name but something given by others? I once held many names. It rattled off several, each with a long, laborious breath before the next. Alakul. Asak, the Littlest Flame. Fagunax. Samael, Reaper of Sorrows. I was once the mighty devourer of worlds. A deep, raspy, labored breath. But now, I am just the Hidden One. A deep tremor shook the ground. Fascinating, Tony said as he took a step towards the stone. Excuse me, people. The rock said it's the devourer of worlds. Why are you trying to talk to it? I'm leaving. Let's go. Please, don't leave me here. It has been far too long. I regained my feet and retreated with Major Broadhorst as the tremors in the shrine intensified. Tony, time to go, old boy. But he did not move. He stood there in a trance. He slowly walked towards the stone and reached into his satchel. Dr. Cortez? The Major shouted. Tony turned to reveal the obsidian dagger in his right hand. In his left, he clutched the stone serpent statue from his office. He used the blade on the end to rip into his shirt. Rows of text were tattooed on his arms, from shoulder to wrist. A green cat's eye took up most of his back, surrounded by rings of burning flames. He turned to face us, blood streaking from his eyes. His chest was a mountain of scar tissue, laceration upon laceration built into a macabre display of self-mutilation. He slid his chest open with the dagger, and blood poured from the wound. What the hell, Tony? I tried to run to him. But Major Broadhorse forcibly dragged me by my arm away from him and towards the nearest open archway. Salvation, Tony said as he held the statue to his spurting chest wound. The blood poured over it and the Corbinite glowed slowly and steadily. He raised his arm and slammed the knife into the shell. My god, I whispered softly. It is an egg. It shattered like glass and a vacuum sucked the air from the room. Each of us was dragged off our feet. A silent pause. Then, an explosion sent tiny shards of Corbinite in all directions. 
The sand and debris settled as I crawled on my hands and knees towards the body in front of me. Tony's lifeless corpse was mangled. His right arm was gone from the elbow down. Both of his eyes were full of metallic shards. A three-foot piece of shrapnel had penetrated his chest and skewered him. He was dead. But he was smiling. A small trickle of blood ran from between a gap where his teeth used to be onto the stone floor. Major Broadhorst stood over me and helped me to my feet. Visibility in the room was near zero. A voice boomed in the cavernous shrine. It was so deafening I could hear it over the ringing in my ears. Finally. I dared a glance back. I wish I hadn't. An eye the size of a car stared at me from the distance. A grotesque bubbling biomass of fleshy tendrils expanded from the back of the green lidless eye. Each tendril split and sprouted new ones, multiplying endlessly. When they each reached a large enough size, they slapped together in a brutal bloody fusion to form larger tendrils. Gallons of green blood soaked every wall and surface of the shrine. The pink fleshy tendrils entwined into one massive strand and slammed to the floor. The eyeball attached to the end, like the face of a pale worm. The thing sprouted wings and claws and teeth. Each shape seemed to grow and mutate and merge with others of its kind, only to be absorbed back into the body to form new horrible type of locomotion. The thin membranous skin split and tore open as muscle tissue sprouted and entwined themselves together to form a heavily muscled serpentine form. Cancerous tumors formed and burst in seconds, revealing bony armor plates. A thunderous screech and two wings ruptured forth from the back and rapidly expanded. A gush of blood from under the eye as a tortured, grotesque jaw formed and extended. The body finally grew to match the size of the eye as it now resembled a form like a colossal winged serpent. Each wing scraped the roof of the 100-foot ceiling and smashed the stone as they continued to stretch. The mouth opened like a hideous flower, four separate jaws each lined with dozens of stubby blunt teeth. The orifice, which I can only vaguely say resembled a throat, spewed a froth that burned the stone as it splattered across the ground. The single eye sat on a bulbous spot at the top of the serpent's 30-foot skull which had no skin left to cover it. The thing turned to face us, and in my head, I could hear the voice speak again. Salvation has come at last. A strong grip on my left arm, and I was yanked into daylight. The Major dragged me down the stairs three at a time. I struggled mightily to keep up. The walls of the ziggurat shook as the ground roared in protest at the presence of an ancient evil awakened once more. The entire temple exploded into rubble. A dust cloud cascaded down the sides of the ziggurat and enveloped us completely. She never stopped though. Her iron grip on my arm kept me going. As we ran, I could hear the rush of air overhead and billowing of sand as mighty wings took flight. I truly have no idea how we survived the trip down. We should have been crushed by stone or suffocated by dust. Instead, we reached the barren earth at the bottom of the ziggurat in relative safety. The workers had fled, and the dig site was abandoned. We rode the elevator back up in complete silence. We slowly crept above the dust cloud, trapped in the pit surrounding the ziggurat. As we broke free of it at 300 feet, the sun shone down upon the ruin. The temple was gone. Pillars were smashed, and nearly a quarter of the structure itself was damaged beyond recognition. Flecks of carbonite shimmered in the sunlight on the ground and all around the ziggurat itself. The abomination was nowhere to be seen. When we reached our base camp, the entire building was in a frenzy. Major Broadhorst made several calls in harsh, hurried tones. She said something about radar tracking and space telemetry, phrases which I didn't understand. My brain couldn't even comprehend everything which had happened. My best friend was dead. And that thing, it had been in my head. To this day, I have no idea where it has gone. I hope and pray it returned to whichever hellish world it came from. I can tell you, I quit my job with my company. I have not consumed a drop of alcohol in six months. I have been in the gym 
four days per week. I don't play damsel in this dress well. And the major, or should I say colonel now, reminds me of it every time we speak. I'm meeting her for coffee tomorrow, which is an upgrade on every relationship I have held for the last five years. But I don't sleep much as I used to. I still hear the voice in my head sometimes. I still see it in my dreams. I can hear the words. The entity spoke to me in my vision much clearer. It is I that sends the word. It is I who summons the plague. Death comes on swift wings. Salvation is here.